Hello, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the uh, Blockchain Transferred Funds uh, webinar, Innovating Pooled Investment Funds. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Rain Steinberg, CEO uh, of ARCA. Uh, today with us, we have our guests, uh, Jerry David, the president of ARCA Labs, David Eastoke, head of FinTech at Coalition Greenwich, and Jay Biancamano, um, head of tokenization at State Street Digital. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, we're going to give a brief intro, um, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation. Uh, so just to uh, let you guys know, uh, before starting ARCA, which is an institutional grade asset manager uh, here in the digital asset space, that's also innovating um, products as well. Um, I co-founded the ETF company Wisdom Tree uh, in the early 2000s, which there's a lot of parallels uh, to what we're talking about here today. Uh, joining us is uh, Jerry. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Rain. Um, hi, everyone. My name is, uh, is JD or Gerald David. Um, I lead Arc Labs Innovation Division, uh, or ARCA's Innovation Division, which is called uh, ARCA Labs. And at ARCA Labs, we're responsible for creating registered digital, digital asset securities uh, and also working on tokenizing funds in partnership with leading financial companies. Um, I yield from the, the traditional uh, financial space. I'm having worked at a bunch of different um, Fortune 500 companies, CME and IMEX included, started a bunch of different exchanges as well, and got involved in the digital asset space uh, circa 2015. Uh, passes across to Jay. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Jay Biancomano, I'm the head of tokenization and the U.S. team here at State Street Digital, uh, focused on building a, uh, a custody and fund administration business around uh, uh, the future of digital, including digital assets, crypto, and um, other new assets in the space. I've uh, been involved in fintech for uh, my entire career. My background is ITG, LiquidNet, um, as well as a stint at um, Pipeline and uh, Fidesa, uh, mostly using technology to change the way people trade, the way trades settle, and using it to just expand the horizon and, and democratizing financial markets. Hand it over to you, David. Thanks, Jay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm David Eastope. I head up the FinTech vertical here at Coalition Greenwich. Coalition Greenwich is a leading provider of strategic benchmarking, analytics, and, and insights to the financial services industry. So I sit in the market structure and technology group, which is a really kind of unique group. We get to look at the intersection of technology, market structure, and regulation to highlight key trends in, in global capital markets. And I've become sort of the digital asset lead within Coalition Greenwich and very much focused on uh, traditional financial assets and securities as well as, as cryptocurrencies. Happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks for joining us today to explain this. Uh, I'll take us into the meat of the presentation now. Um, here were our bios. That could have been up while we talked. Um, <laughs> uh, but what we're really here to talk about is um, digital asset securities, this new structure, and why it's important. Uh, just to contextualize for people that are joining, first we wanted to explain uh, this digital asset security survey, uh, survey that, we, uh, co uh, that we did in, uh, adjacently with uh, Coalition Greenwich, uh, really to kind of contextualize what is the environment, uh, what is the demand, uh, what's going on here, uh, how, what are digital asset securities people, uh, you know, and like who really is interested in that? Uh, so if you can walk us through, uh, David, uh, kind of the uh, methodology behind the survey, what we found, you know, some of these things would be helpful. Absolutely, Rain. Thank you. Yeah, we like to think this is this is truly the definitive digital asset security study. So I'm happy to explain uh, the methodology and, and how we went about it. So first of all, as a firm, we do over 25,000 interviews annually. So we're really well versed in in generating these high quality studies. And for this particular study, the digital asset security study, we talked to a very informed audience, predominantly in North America and Europe, also a little bit of Asia. And then we collected over 100 responses over a period of several weeks, uh, sort of late last year. And our survey touched some of the key market segments, the truly important ones, the market infrastructures, banks, brokers, exchanges, uh, buy side, and tech companies, to name a few. And you know, as you mentioned, Rain, the, the, a study like this really allows you to go deeper, to get a better sense of real market sentiment, real use cases around digital asset securities, and then not only looking at the, these segments that I outlined, but also looking at roles. So whether you're in front office, 
you're in technology and operations or you're in senior management, you may have slightly nuanced views uh, to, uh, to this overall space. So, you know, the most important thing perhaps also is that these are respondents who are actually very focused on implementing blockchain solutions for capital markets. As you can see here over half, uh, have three or more years of experience. So to summarize, high quality, engaged, and informed audience uh, across the globe. So this really gives you an idea of the breadth of the people surveyed, their expertise, um, you know, and like you said, to summary, high quality, institutional grade. Um, and we were really trying to see what this group of people um, knew about digital asset securities, how they felt about them, um, and really get kind of like a baseline uh, for where we were. So let, let's go to some of the interesting findings. Great. Yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll take it from here. You know, the, just to note one more time about the respondents. So these questions now, these insights are specifically around the topic of today, digital asset securities. And these respondents, once again, are, are really focused on real, implement, real implementations. So just under 70% are focused on implementing blockchain for capital markets with 45% describing themselves as very or extremely focused. So you have a very engaged, an audience who is very familiar with digital asset security, 76%. And these are the ones that are actually going about and building and implementing the, uh, the overall solutions in, in the market. And so we have a group of builders, investors, service providers making this, this overall segment a reality. And here we can see that a strong majority of them uh, actually believe that most securities will be digitized and settled on a blockchain in the next five to 10 years. So 77%, that's a, that's a big number. And as we can probably all agree, that's not a long time in the really regulated you know, security sector to see such a dramatic shift to happen. So I think of this along two lines. One is a very strong level of conviction, but also a pretty strong view around the pace of this development. And, you know, I think the other thing to look at is what assets do respondents want to see tokenized? And Jay, this will probably be potentially part of your roadmap going forward. But what we see here is that there are, uh, there's a great deal of, of interest in looking specifically at investment funds. So 61% of respondents want to see investment funds tokenized. So that's a strong indicator. This is amongst a broad range of assets that people do want to see tokenization, you know, form around. And I think just looking out some other things that will continue to kind of support this evolution and this growth would be more education, uh, more available supply, secondary liquidity, all these things that kind of form around a, a, a new framework, right? That's been launched to change how we do things, how the combination of public and permission blockchains and DLT can work together to create kind of a new framework for, for digital asset security. So I think there was, you know, Rain, we've discussed this before, a lot of conviction, a lot of interest, and I think it's both the, the level and pace here. Yeah, and before I uh, pass it to Jay to talk about uh, the way he sees like technological innovation here and some of the things in the past, I, I don't think that that can be stressed enough um, that we're talking about 77% of participants, institutional grade ones that believe all securities uh, settlement will be digitized and occur on the blockchain within five to 10 years. That means stock transactions, bond transactions. Uh, I would say when you talk about pace of change, that, that five to 10 year uh, window is very important, but also the pace of change of answers like this. I would say if you conducted this survey probably even a year ago, that 77% would have probably been maybe five, 10%. Uh, the, the amount of people that are coming over to seeing this as the future, that pace of change is incredibly fast as well. Uh, it, it, can you speak at all um, about you know, technological uh, innovation in securities markets here, Jay, to contextualize this for people? Sure, absolutely. So you know, there's, a, there's a number of precedents um, in the markets uh, when we look at how historically the markets have evolved using technology. But the one thing I want to you know, say, say overarching in this, this presentation, if you would ask the same question, maybe, like you said, three or four years ago, 
there wouldn't have been a lot of response. People starting to understand what blockchain means, right? So every, we're moving away from the B word, which is you know Bitcoin, right? And we're getting into really what the technology is and how the technology can improve what the you know what what we do in this space. So historically, you know, the markets have always used technology to advance themselves, and a good precedent um, would be when we dematerialized in the '90s. If you remember, like me and age yourself, you remember when we had stock certificates and coupons, and we had you know tangible assets assets that had to be moved, bearer bonds. Um, I remember the days people were pushing these large um, containers down Wall Street to move from uh, one venue to another. And what happened was we had the age of dematerialization, right? We went to electronic ledgers. And what happened there was, was profound there. So, so there are a couple of things that I think I want to point out. The first thing is we went from the ability to take processes um, and scale them. So instead of doing, you know, maybe uh, 10,000 different types of uh, reconciliations a day in the bond world, we could do millions. If we lo look in the equities market, instead of trading, you know, tens of 20 million uh, uh, investment um, equities, we went to trading billions and we, we were able to scale. So those processes really didn't go away. But the fascinating thing that really happened was with the age of electronification, the regulators drew a line in the sand and said, at this point, instruments have to be electronic, right? And yep. that created a whole new profound um, uh, product suite that we could offer clients, including um, because we were collecting data, we, we had TCA, we had algorithms, and this was across all asset classes. And now if you look at digitization, digitization is doing something very, very uh, important. It's eliminating a lot of those processes that we scaled up in the age of dematerialization but it's creating more opportunities in the space. And that's what we're really looking at at State Street. And I think everybody's looking at what are the opportunities in the space that actually are allowing us to scale and to create a better investment um, experience to our clients. And certainly, you know, knowing what I do about, um, you know, a, a, a blockchain um, funds that you're presenting today, it is a technological innovation that is something that I think blockchain um, would allow to innovate fairly quickly. Now, the one thing that I think that's that's missing in this is, is the regulatory line in the sand, right? So in, in the 90s, when we said, okay, everything's going to become electronic, I don't really see regulators saying, you know, everything has to go on blockchain at one at a certain point in time. But I do think they will start to embrace the technology as um, a way to improve um, protection of the clients, improve client experience, including, you know, improve the way reconciliations are done, and just improve the way, you know, um, assets are democratized and available to, to you know, um, more, I say, constituents. So it's really, you know, it's really an evolving market right now. It's an evolving market structure. And it's exciting. I think, you know, the first thing that I think we'll start to see is, is private equity funds. And I think that's right in line with what we're talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Jay, for contextualizing it. Um, and I think it's a really great transition. So while we've been talking uh, to this point about digital asset securities uh, in general, um, let's, let's uh, give an example of one of these digital asset securities, uh, the, the blockchain transfer fund. And just to give an example of what, what blockchain can do uh, to a fund and some of the benefits and things that can Im be imbued for investor experience, potential costs, um, all these things um, that we're talking about. Because, I mean, that's technological innovation. If you don't get the benefits, what's the point? So what are we really talking about, JD, if you can take us through uh, the blockchain transfer fund and the value proposition? Yeah, so I think that when we talk about the blockchain transfer fund, what we're really talking about is the evolution of traditional 40 act funds and markets. And, you know, kind of what Jay just said a second ago is, you know, kind of right out of, you know, why we did what we did and why we believe that, you know, BTFs themselves um, are the future and it's eliminating processes and creating efficiencies. And when you take blockchain and you add blockchain into the mix with reference to things like, you know, traditional 40 acts, there are some benefits that, you know, ultimately are produced. And the way that the, you know, kind of the world looked at, you know, traditional 40 act funds, um, you know, was, uh, was that there were structures that were regulated by the SEC. And if one were to, you know, become an advisor of one of these funds, that there were some regulatory requirements and one had to adhere to. Um, and the most profound of them, you know, really are that your assets are being held in a regulatory trust. Um, but there was also a series of different service providers, State Street being one of them that provided additional services to support the fund. Right. One would have an independent auditor or an administrator, independent board of trustees that don't report directly to fund administrator, but that report to the SEC directly. Uh, and all these different precautions were put in place in order to allow for, um, you know, kind of customer protections that would exist uh, and allow for finance to work in a seamless fashion. 
Um, and there's also transparency elements, which are super important when you're thinking about what the 40 Act really is and what it stands for. Um, and these are all different forms of reporting, whether it be a, you know an annual uh, financial report, semi-annual report, um, you know, daily, you know, publishing and, and transparency with reference to things like NAB or even, you know, through, um, you know, online services like Edgar, which will then consolidate and compile all the different filings that one had to the SEC. Now, all those different requirements, as they say, you know, are great and they've worked, um, you know, kind of for, you know, kind of since the, you know, 1920s when mutual funds came into existence under the Act. Um, but what you end up really having when you think about, you know, the power of eliminating some of these processes and creating efficiencies is adding in not B as in Bitcoin, but B as in blockchain. And when you start adding in blockchain, the benefits become quite profound. What we're talking about now is a level of transparency that's been unprecedented in the past and provides benefits that are incredibly important uh, for folks that choose to engage with these kind of funds, these products. So when we talk about you know, taking blockchain and inserting it to the heart of the fund, um, you're dealing with a distributed ledger. You know, you're dealing with you know, immutable record keeping. You're dealing with a whole host of different benefits now um, that are so profound. And they're more than what I just stated a second ago. You're talking about things like execution. You're talking about taking a, um, a, a, a prospectus or a registration statement that one would file with the SEC and using smart contracts to enforce rules like AML KYC, to enforce rules like AI or, or QP participation or others. Um, and I think that what you end up seeing as a byproduct is that the, the consumer is the one that benefits. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a compression and a reduction in fees. We're talking about um, the elimination of processes and third parties that may cause friction. And you're talking about uh, a, a, a massive contraction and reduction in time, which allows for things like faster settlement, faster transferability, and many other use cases that when you think about the power of this structure as it's envisioned through blockchain, add benefits to financial service in ways that many haven't even contemplated just yet. That's really, uh, JD, thanks for uh, giving those benefits broadly. I, I would love to hear if Jay had any thoughts uh, specifically sitting in the State Street uh, seat of what you saw those benefits specifically maybe uh, for State Street clients or how, how State Street looks at uh, this type of value proposition. Well, certainly we've been investigating um, blockchain for around mutual funds and ETFs for, for well over you know, two or three years right now. And you know, the thing that actually is attractive to us is the ability for the immutable record keeping um, and the ability for faster settlements, right? So if you think about having to um, settle a coin versus a coin in a cryptocurrency world, it's no different doing something in a, in a, in a mutual fund world. So the, the ability to move between funds um, is very frictionless in a, in, a, in a blockchain world. So you know, if I want to move into my, you know, my uh, treasury fund or out of my equities fund, it's, it, it requires me to liquidate and then, uh, you know, move cash and then just, uh, you know, buy. But in a, uh, in a peer to peer transference world where you could use blockchain, the actual fund becomes the currency. That's what I tell people. It becomes the currency and the ability to move between currencies in the crypto world is very simple. I could move between Cardano and Bitcoin very quickly. Now take that same thing, that same idea and be able to do it between funds and the ability for people to, to you know, more quickly move in and out of portfolios, um, you know, make investments that they wanna do very quickly. I think it's very attractive. And I think really the one thing that I really like um, <clears throat> about is the fractionalization. So if you think about traditional mutual funds, probably not much of an issue, but in private equity funds, fractionalization is a very, very profound and attractive uh, a business alternative, right? So um, if I'm a um, certainly an underwriter of private equity funds, the ability for me to liquidate a portion of my fund and do so in a way that allows me to create tokens that I could offer to retail investors, very attractive. So we're, you know, we're, um, you know, very heavily invested in the space. Um, State Street is looking very closely at private equity, private debt, um, and tokenization around it. So there is a, a number, I think, of, uh, of clients that we've been speaking to that are looking to do this as well. They see the attractiveness of it. You know, they look at Coinbase and they see people trading, you know, 23 million people trading coins, trading crypto, right? And to be able to access that constituency and provide a very liquid um, experience and a very, um, I would say, um, frictionless opportunity to invest in new asset classes, very profound and something we're, we're very uh, focused on. Thanks for that. That's, and that's very interesting and very important for people to realize. These are innovators that are looking at this space and this combination of blockchain, which 
almost everybody that agrees is uh, that comes up against it is, is innovative, disruptive. But then when you start dealing with the regulated environment of securities, this is where it, it becomes difficult. And this is specifically a technology that kind of breaks down you know, normal geographic barriers, you know, walled environments like exchanges. So these are, these are actually quite large questions that have to be answered. And that kind of brings us to um, our next slide, um, which is something I have a little uh, bit of experience with, but only at the, the tail end. Uh, this kind of history of investment vehicles um, and what, what change looks like uh, in these areas um, from what we can all agree um, we're, and we're here we're going to be talking about uh, ETFs versus 4 p.m. closed mutual funds and kind of this trajectory of historical innovation. And J.D. touched upon it. You know, we had commingled funds coming about uh, in the 20s. Um, you have the, the 40 Act, which is really the, you know, the SEC Act of 1940, which regulated uh, commingled structures and gave us, you know, this investor protection, transparency, transparency around fees, all of these fantastic things. But that was, you know, 1940. And then really the next big innovation in commingled investment products being the advent of the ETF, which, um, as I mentioned, I know a little bit about, uh, but only on the tail end. Um, so the ETF really came out of the 1987 crash, uh, where uh, the regulatory bodies thought uh, the equity world uh, needed something like more liquid to kind of track things like the futures. And they did a big investigation. Um, and the outcome of that was the ETF structure and the first ETF in 1993. So that's from 87 to 93, that's six years right there. And then um, by the time I got involved with ETFs, which is in the early 2000s, so that's another decade on top of it, um, ETFs were only 40 billion in assets uh, when we launched Wisdom Tree. Now Wisdom Tree has, I don't know, 60, 70 billion under management itself, but the entire space was 40 billion. There was really only iShares there. Um, so this is now basically two decades after it. And now we like snap uh, forward to uh, the current time where we have about 9 trillion in assets. And I can tell you at the time that we launched Wisdom Tree, there was not a consensus in the industry that the ETF was going to be um, the dominant structure that it was. Um, and there were a lot of businesses that were attached uh, to 4 p.m. closed mutual fund businesses that were attached to selling things with a load um, that were um, resistant, you know, to bringing it out low fee product. Um, and it wasn't evident that that structure was going to win. But what I would say that history has taught us is that when we're talking about better liquidity, lower fees, more utility, better transference, all of those things, um, these, these lead to um, better adoption cycles. And this is really uh, an outline of that process. And JD, do you wanna talk about uh, any of the benefits that as we see in this chain of value when we talk about the 20s to the 90s uh, to the 2000s? So we have that step function of utility from you know, unregulated commingled products to regulated 4 p.m. closed products to ETFs to now we have this next step change. And you know, <laughs> as people see, these are multi-decadal <laughs> type yeah. of blocks that we're looking at, but talk a little bit um, about you know, that kind of next step change as you see it uh, in this product set. Absolutely. I mean, we, the way that we look at this next wave of iterations of 40 Act products is essentially, you know, products that are steeped in technology. Um, we talked about, you know, the term blockchain transferred fund and inherent in its name is the word blockchain. And the blockchain, as we said before, just facilitates these, these advancements, um, you know, in 40 Act products. We were talking about peer-to-peer -peer transferability a second ago, and Jay was giving some examples of how State Street views that. Well, what if we were to take that, that example one step further? And what if you're able to transfer, not just in and out of a, just one fund to another, but if, what if you were able to transfer an asset, right? A share of that fund, a digital asset. And I can send that to David and David can send that to Jay. And it's not representative of, let's say a dollar, but let's, rep but let's say it's representative of a share of a portfolio of equities, right? Or a share of a portfolio of real estate or any of the other options that are being discussed right now uh, within these wrappers 
um, for BTX. Uh, and I think that's incredibly powerful because it's never been seen before. You've had to go to an exchange in order to do that. You've had to go to a bank or a broker or a fund intermediary. Um, and you know this peer-to-peer -peer transfer for transferability in a relatively short period of time allows for additional access to markets that others haven't had before. When you combine that with the re reduced need for intermediaries, what you're talking about are significant efficiencies. Efficiencies in processes, uh, reductions in time, you add in things like 24-7, 365 market access, and now you're talking about being able to perform banking functions and transfer functions. You know, on, on weekends, you're talking about you know, cross-border different um, transfers of different assets. Uh, when banks are closed, when nights are dark and days are bright in other different places, and the power of that is really, really, really important. The final thing really is that it, it, we've now, we're now talking about is the utility of an investment. So you're investing in a vehicle, right? You're buying a share of the fund and it also satisfies a role of exchange. And this is where the blending of technology with traditional finance is incredible, is incredible because the benefits we're talking about now um, are going to affect the way that people are transacting. They're going to affect the way that people themselves um, are, are viewing traditional banking. And they're also going to allow for additional efficiencies that we're not even talking about just yet on this yeah. call. Let's, let's, let's talk about that um, because I think um, what people don't understand is that it's very hard to see uh, these use cases before they actually exist. So if we go back to um, this idea of uh, what were ETFs uh, used for uh, beforehand or the concept, it was thought of to be just a commingled investment vehicle that had intraday liquidity and some tax advantages. By actually adding um, utility, the, the addition of intraday liquidity came up with all sorts of different things. You know, you started having uh, cash equitization, use, use and rebalancing, um, this idea of adding inverse and leverage to, to, to vehicles that was not conceived when the spider launched in 1993. So that same type of utility, uh, you know, that we're talking about here is by adding, you know, as JD says, instantaneous settlement, um, infinitely divisible, um, as Jay pointed out, um, not such a big deal in, in mutual fund ownership, um, but when you get into private equity ownership, you know, to break it down into extreme fractionalization. But I would even argue that there's interesting limits that you have even at share denominations of ETFs. You have an artificial um, split there. Um, and when you actually compress fractionalization down to where we're talking about in blockchain, down to eight decimals, you start to enter the world of being able to deploy what were at one time investment vehicles uh, as payment vehicles, or you know, to combine certain aspects that are no longer limited. Now, we're at very early stages of this, and I don't want to um, overstate where this is, but this is this is kind of these were not the conversations that were happening um, in 1987 and 1993 about the use cases of ETFs, and even as late as 2000s. Um, I was having discussions with with large asset managers saying, why do we need an ETF practice? Um, and that was in the mid 2000s saying, we have no desire to compress our fees or to create products that compete uh, with our current product set. Nobody has a desire to create products that compete with their, their current product set or compress their own fees. However, other people might create these products uh, and create these situations for you. Um, let's go to um, some of these institutional use cases um, that you were talking about, uh, JD. Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, I mean, Jay, I can only imagine, you know, kind of coming from within State Street, how many different applications that you guys have conceived of during whiteboard sessions regarding how, you know, BTFs or other instruments that incorporate blockchain can solve so many problems, right? And, you know, kind of from our standpoint, one of the places that we look at are things as simple as, you know, replacing a U.S. dollar, right? Like how cool would it be if we could take, you know, kind of the U.S. dollar, so they maintain somewhat of a stable value, but also has the components of either being rated or regulated, right? Which are critically important for you know, large scale financial institutions uh, who want to get involved in the space and need to have the additional comfort. Um, that there's a product that's out there that's not going to evaporate, right? And that's why I think, you know, the BTF becomes so intriguing is because it does have that 
um, you know, it has gone through that process with the SEC, whereby the advisor of the fund has filed a prospectus and has publicly stated in a transparent fashion what it is that they want to uh, uh, actually achieve with reference to that fund. And one of the places, whether it be treasury management, collateral management, um, or any of these other you know, US dollar proxy use cases that have been conceived of before, um, become incredibly powerful because you're reducing things like time uh, and you're providing certainty to the market and to market participants. So things like the 4 p.m. market close has always been a problem. And it's been a problem because now you've got your back up against the wall. And ultimately, if you extend that a little bit further, you're dealing with you know, the T, T1, T2, T3 settlement cycle. And you're thinking about how it is that you could settle a trade and how it is you could actually um, utilize um, you know, kind of a US dollar and you're beholden by rules that exist already. So by using blockchain technology, you're simply beholden to the ability of how fast you can create a block or how fast your data can contain within that block and it can be transferred. And in many cases, you're talking about a transfer within 10 minutes or maybe a little bit more, uh, which provides incredible certainty to a marketplace and reduces things like risk and exposure. Um, so one of the other things that, you know, kind of you, within collateral management, you're dealing with time and cost, right? And of those collateral movements. And what ends up happening, obviously, is that there's an obligation from one party to the other to deliver that collateral. But the longer that cycle goes on, the more risk enters the equation. And if you're able to carve off 23 hours or, or, or 47 hours worth of risk, uh, then ultimately you're not only reducing risk for both counterparts of that transaction, but you're reducing risk for the entire marketplace and cutting out systemic risk that exists as well. So, you know, kind of collateral management, um, you know, is ripe for innovation. Um, and, you know, kind of from our standpoint, um, you know, kind of it's a, it, it is one of the use cases that we believe uh, that large scale financial institutions should be embracing in order to mitigate widespread counterparty credit risk and facilitate a faster transfer and settlement uh, function for transactions. Thanks for that, JD. Again, uh, Jay, um, sitting in State Street's uh, seat um, is, you know, hugely innovative and important uh, to the BTF ecosystem. I mean, ETF. Pardon me, Freudian slip. Um, how do you how do you see if you could describe theoretically or actually how you would see using either something like the BTF structure or um, digital securities just in general uh, at State Street? So there's a number of ways to unpack that, but really we, we are heavily invested in looking at the, uh, the you putting uh, funds, uh, ETFs, as well as mutual funds on the blockchain. And for a lot of the reasons you outlined here, but one of the things I think you haven't touched upon yet, if you recall, you know, mutual funds and ETF funds were basically created as retail facing funds, right? They were, they were really able to democratize and become retail facing. What's actually happened in the last, I would say 10 years or so, it's become um, an institutional investment. Right. So if you if you think about um, ETFs today, we have thousands of them. They've become very um, you know, they're widely used by institutions in order to move into certain, you know, certain asset classes. Um, and we even see institutions coming to us and saying, listen, you know, you know, when a Bitcoin ETF is approved, we're, that's what we're going to invest in, because that's what we're going to make the market, not not to conflate this discussion here or hijack that discussion. But that's really where if you understand what institutions are looking at today, they, they understand the value of blockchain, right? So we are involved in a number of use cases in the, in the collateral space um, about the efficient movement of collateral, collateral efficient movement of CSAs. Um, we're also looking um, in two use cases for T plus zero settlement, right? So if you think about the, um, let's use the equity markets, for example, you know, if you want to do a, a T plus zero settlement in the equity market, you can do it in theory, you do it. But actually what's happening is you're, you're um, extending credit, the broker's extending credit for three days because there's a yep. regular settlement cycle around that. So you're carrying that 48 or 72 hours of, of, uh, of risk, counterparty risk. With blockchain, right, that's done immediately, right? It's offset, you net cash, you net securities. And in effect, the efficiencies that come with that for the buyer is you have direct immediate access, right? So any corporate action that's surrounding that particular um, instrument is, is yours. And then you have the seller, which is actually getting the cash immediately, which actually makes cash available to market. So, you know, those two profound use cases, I think, are the areas I think institutions are embracing. And then the, the, the last piece of it is the liquidity, right? The liquidity that ETFs offer to move into some of these more esoteric asset classes um, is something that is very attractive to institutions. But to do it in size, 
lives, to do it in a way that allows them to access a larger constituency, certainly in some of these very esoteric private equity funds and private debt instruments. It's something that needs to be democratized. And that's the, the use case that excites me is to create that venue or that facility for institutions to access multiple pools of liquidity and do so in a way that is allows them to enter into trades, enter transactions, and just settle in a timely manner, which would be you know, 10 minutes in a, in a perfect world. And but you know, final, what I'll put out there is, if you also look at how asset classes trade today, very disparate, you have fixed income, you have equity, you have, a, you know, you have synth- you know, um, um, syndicated loans, all of those are traded very disparately. So a portfolio manager has to move in and out of, of certain asset class and there's a lot of friction there. If everything trades on a blockchain, very, e- very easy to do a transition, to move from one portfolio to another portfolio. Portfolio transitions used to take days, sometimes even weeks. You could do that almost instantly in a, in a liquidity provisioned world, but also do so in a way that tokens offset versus tokens or blockchain offsets versus blockchain. So to me, that's the real attractiveness coming from that institutional trading background. I think that's going to see the most profound change in our, uh, in our way is, is multiple assets trading seamlessly on a single type of solution. That's fascinating. Um, gentlemen, uh, I think this brings us to the end of our uh, prepared uh, part of the presentation. Um, I would really like to invite everybody uh, to really join all of us, and I mean all of us, us on the phone and those not, um, but building uh, the future of financial services. Um, we have a few questions uh, that people have dropped in. Um, so feel free to drop Q and A uh, in there if you're on the webinar live. Um, here's an interesting question. I think this one's for you, JD. Uh, we have an index we would like to create a BTF around, I assume. Uh, it is long only equities from developed markets. Is that okay? Uh, what a what a cool question, and uh, you know what that demonstrates to me is that we've done a pretty good job here of kind of captivating the imagination of folks that are you know kind of participating and listening here, um, because that's precisely you know kind of what we believe the future is, um, and you know according to the um, you know data that you know kind of Greenwich Coalition has compiled that you know kind of our constituents believe the future is as well, and you know kind of we believe that there's a world whereby anything that you know would fit into a forty act wrapper, whether that be something um, that would be in a traditional ETF. Um, whether it be long only equities from developed markets, um, you know, th- those are the kind of products that we're talking with third parties about right now with reference to how is that we could advance the market. Some of the things that Jay is working on are going to do that as well, taking existing ETFs and tokenizing them. Um, but I think that, you know, from our perspective, that's one way of attacking things. There's another way, which is creating new and new and innovative products that may not even exist right now. That might tap into a new audience that are blockchain savvy or might tap into an audience that's interested in exploring how blockchains work. So, um, you know, kind of when we look at creating a BTFs, we think about, you know, kind of what kind of a security we can put within that wrapper. And long only equities and belt markets are squarely, you know, kind of where, you know, kind of uh, we believe there can be advancements with reference to 40 Act products. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jade. Um, we have another question from Ben. Um, we would like to build a BTF around secondary market for oil and gas royalty owners. There is no secondary market currently. We wonder if that's within the purview of the BTF, or is that application is more smart contract specific? That's for you, JD. You're on mute. Oh, we're going to get away uh, at least one time in this webinar without anyone anyone saying you're on mute. So I apologize <laughs> to everyone. Had to Thank you that. for making that okay. <laughs> so um, I, I think that, you know, kind of the exploration in oil gas that we've been spending a lot of time on, um, we think that, you know, kind of commodities um, within this structure make a whole lot of sense. We haven't specifically investigated things like oil and gas royalties, um, but, you know, kind of that's a conversation that, you know, kind of pending, you know, your availability, Ben, that we'd love to have. Um, I'd love to learn more about that because I come from the energy markets um, and the places that we've been investigating are how is it that we could create uh, BTFs. BTFs uh, around, um, you know, kind of different, uh, you know, grades of oil, um, you know, kind of different, uh, 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 you know, kind of um, regional natural gas plays. So I think that there's a a, a whole bunch of different conversations we'd love to have. And, um, you know, we'll figure out how to get hold of you, uh, Ben, um, to further that conversation and give you some clarity on what our view would be um, on how, you know, oil and gas royalties uh, could function within the structure. Yeah, and I can say is if it's if it could be in an ETF just because it or a mutual fund or a 40 act product, um, it could definitely be in this, um, and it would be very interesting. And uh, Ben helpfully uh, helps y'all call me. 
the y'all equals Texas. So we will just yell at Texas uh, for Ben. Um, next, I have another interesting one. I think this is uh, germane. Uh, we've talked about all these benefits um, and the inevitability and how foolish people were not to adopt ETFs in the early 2000s. What do you think is the biggest um, impediment to adoption if um, you know, the benefits are so apparent here, guys? What, what, what do you think um, is the number one things or some of the things that need to be uh, settled or you know, to make this 77% of people be right or the, the inevitability of these type of transactions occurring on chain? Start with you, Jay, and how you see it. Well, it has to come down to there can't just be one and you can't do digitization, tokenization just for digitization and tokenization space of purposes, right? right? So what's happened in the last couple of years, there have been a, a number of, of tokenized platforms, a number of tokenized assets, but all of them are pretty much not investment grade. What really has to happen is you have to actually have investment grade assets and it has to be very transparent to the end user, right? So if you think about it, the retail investor, if you think about the um, institutional investor, they, help, they have very disparate ways of investing. But at the end of the day, the experience has to be very transparent and seamless. So they wanna be able to move into any asset class and out of any asset class the same way they're, they're used to, unless you can make that better, right? Unless you can make that easier and better. And so the, the challenge with any new technology and certainly with blockchain has been, how does it make it better? How is it able, how am I able to use this um, to make a better experience for me? And sometimes it's really not to the end investor, it's really to the issuer, right? If the issuer in this space is able to, to issue an asset and access liquidity far more efficiently and receive a, you know, far more um, uh, available liquidity than he would in a, in a typical uh, instrument or a typical you know, underwriting. So I think it really comes down to, you know, the adopters here are less going to be the buyers and sellers of these instruments because we will, you know, if tomorrow ETFs go away and, be, you know, and, and BTFs are available, we're just going to do it, right? Same, same way we move from mutual funds to ETFs. So it really comes down how the issuer's experience is better. And finally, how the fund administrators, the people who service these assets are able right. to um, uh, service them as well as they do any other asset. You know, our job here, what we do better than anybody in the world, I think right now is service ETF assets at State Street, right? I think, you know, we Absolutely. have really, you know, a very good business around that. And, you know, the excitement really is, can we make that ETF issuer a better experience by using a blockchain, by using, you know, um, blockchain transferred funds? Yes, I think so. And it and it's, it's, it's comes down to when we will have more liquidation, uh, more, I'm sorry, more liquidity in these assets. And I, I, you've probably heard me say this before, it's, it's trickle, trickle flood. You'll probably see three or four or five of these things come out in the next year. And then pretty soon when you see, you know, um, a billion investment in somebody's treasury and somebody's um, treasury fund because it's a BTF, uh, then people start, you know, start paying attention. But I think they are paying attention. And certainly I think this is a, a very prescient time, a very prescient product that you guys have come up with. Anything to add to that, JD or David? Uh, I, I want to add on that. I think that the, Jay, you mentioned secondary liquidity. Um, that, that's certainly a, a big part of it. But I think maybe we haven't emphasized that, and you mentioned a little bit on the fund administration side, that you know, tokenized funds can offer huge efficiencies in that fund admin and other back office tasks. And then, you know, anytime you talk about changing the middle and back office roles across a huge swath of, of capital markets, you start to see individuals, people, and their, their workflows disrupted or their need to, to adopt a new platform at the same time while they're on an existing platform. So I think you, you almost need to see, uh, and it's good to see the middle and back office get some love and attention here, right? You need to see an effort and focus to bring those people, those groups into the conversation as well, and to show them that this could be a way to actually improve the way things are done rather than kind of a, a threat to the way things have always been. Um, there's always a little bit of hesitance and resistance to things as they as they come, become new. But I think that kind of middle and back office functions can have huge potential to really reinvent the way they do things. And I think that's uh, going to be one of the benefits over time. Awesome. Thank you, David. Agreed. JD, any final adopts on the inevitability of the BTF structure and digital asset securities and what might stand in the way? Uh, yeah, uh, alongside with Jay's ESG uh, talk, let's go to another hour for that one. Um, <laughs> but what I do think I can say is that, um, you know, this has been pretty cool talking about the BTF and recognizing that it really is the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, it's the tip of the iceberg in the advent of how blockchain is going to infect 
uh, is going to affect the way that we uh, transact, the way that we subscribe, the way that we interact from finance, from a financial perspective. Um, and even as Jay was pointing out as well, there are going to be changes that are going to be seen with reference to things like service team and how they interact. And we're already seeing that right now in the construct of our fund with the convergence of things like the transfer agent and the issuing platform and things of that nature. So I think that what we're all talking about here are efficiencies in the way we operate uh, and providing benefits to the end user, the subscriber, the investor, and the client. And um, I think this is a great first step as the market begins to understand the power and the technology of the way that blockchain can affect things. Um, and it was amazing to be able to talk about all this stuff today. Awesome. Uh, thanks, guys. I just want to uh, answer my own question since I have that uh, purview. And then I think we'll wrap it up. But I also think that uh, the regulatory environment here, and I, I don't think we can overstate the complexity that regulators are dealing with in this technology, which, you know, like I said, uh, kind of explodes geographic differences, explodes uh, walled gardens like exchanges. Um, there's all sorts of very fundamental questions uh, that are being answered here. But where some people I think see regulation as an impediment um, to blockchain, I really see it as actually an accelerant really. Because when we talk about the people that have the assets, we're talking about institutions, we're talking about th this is where the large asset holders have, you need regulatory clarity actually for them to get involved. And I think as tragic as what we're seeing going on um, you know, in uh, uh, Eastern Europe uh, right now, it shows um, some of the issues that we have um, in unregulated blockchains and some of the confusion around that. Um, I think a lot of players are looking for some regulatory clarity here. And as we get that, and I know the regulators are working on that in this very complicated situation, I think you're even going to get uh, more adoption, especially from uh, the type of people uh, that we work with. Uh, so everybody, thanks so much uh, for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and uh, please, uh, you know, if you have any questions, reach out. Uh, via email. Uh, there will be a recording of the webinar. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a great day. Thanks, Ram. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you.